happy to introduce Jason Onks. Jason is the proprietor of Onks Woodland Specialist in Smyrna, Tennessee, right? That's correct. And he's here to tell us about <coughs> things we should and should not do with our oboes. Um, I'm going to duck out a few minutes early to get the next piece sure. ready. Sure. But please welcome Jason cool. Onks. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, so just uh, briefly, um, uh, thanks for having me and letting me have this time today. Um, I appreciate Hannah um, asking me to come with the, all the oboes and kind of keep the things in adjustment. Um, so thanks to Hannah, even though she's not in here. Um, but yeah, so uh, my name's Jason Onks. Uh, very briefly, oboe player uh, turned re uh, oboe repair guy. And um, I've been repairing almost 20 years. Um, started my business about 13 or 14 years ago, uh, just doing oboes. So we're in Smyrna, Tennessee, just outside of Nashville, and uh, life's great. So hope, hopefully it is for you guys too. Um, but yeah, I don't want to talk too much about me. Uh, I just want to be able to utilize this time to provide information and content for you guys. Um, so I want to go over some basics with you about things that you can do um, to help prolong the, your the oboe life, right? make your robo last as long as possible because there's a lot of stuff going on with it and really it just comes down to like everyday handling and that kind of stuff so the you know kind of the basics um, and then after I go through that we can just open it up to questions so anything you guys have that's on your mind we can talk about really whatever comes to your mind right I'll try to answer them if I can so uh, does somebody have an oboe that they want to demonstrate with um, whoever gets there faster so assembling <laughs> assembling your oboe right I mean you guys have been playing oboe for a long time we're not in sixth grade band anymore uh, but sometimes we forget that grabbing an oboe in the wrong position can do some good damage right you want to demonstrate on her so I've taught on her well she's doing it right <laughs> Very good. So can I demonstrate? Thank you. Um, so, um, you know, a lot of uh, beginning kids play and their band directors really don't know how to appropriately hold an oboe or a woodwind instrument because they were a tuba player. And so from the beginning, uh, we're not really taught how to handle um, an oboe. And so uh, a lot of people grab them. And if you, if you do this, I'm not calling you out. I'm just, these are things that I see as a repair person. I know that these things uh, can damage instruments um, and they can uh, make pads uh, go bad quicker. Um, all the little adjustment corks that are underneath all the little screws can get damaged and your robot can go out of adjustment and just not perform. So a lot of times I'll see um, you know, individuals just grab them. They'll grab over the mechanism just like this, right? and then they just kind of shove it all together. So the first time you do that, you're not gonna see any negative, um, uh, negative actions or you know, the instrument will play just fine. But after you do that about 20 times, 30 times, 40 times, you're gonna start to notice your instrument's not playing as well. Uh, a lot of times uh, keys can bind up. Uh, the biggest one we see in the shop is uh, for this uh, right hand C sharp E flat lever. Uh, there's two keys on this one rod and this part of the key, I don't know if you can see it, sticks up higher than the rest. And so a lot of people grab right there, just like they're making a fist, gonna punch somebody, right? Um, and so over time, every time they grab that, that presses that lever down, and then those keys bind up, and then they say, oh, my C-sharp sticks, uh, or my E-flat stands open, or something like that. So. As a generalization, I recommend that you do not squeeze your keys unless you're playing it. Okay? And so for assembly, that would look like this. Um, I'll take the lower and the bell together. I approach, I'm right-handed, so I'll approach underneath the lower joint with my left hand. Um, actually, sorry, down here. Because um, you can actually put your thumb against this post on the bottom. So, and I'm squeezing with all my fingertips. And so like that, you're not gonna drop your oboe. And then approach this one. I go ahead and get my joints lined up 
uh, before they're put all the way together and just very, very slowly push that together. That way I haven't grabbed any keys at all. And then I'll do the same thing. So approach from underneath and here up here you can grab around the crown and that way you're not grabbing any keys. It's just laying in the palm of your hand. <clears throat> and then switching to the lower, my right hand does go over the keys, but again, I'm squeezing the wood. I'm not squeezing the, uh, the rods. And then get it started. Go ahead and line up those bridge keys. The most important bridge key is on the right side. Okay, so we'll line that up and then just very slowly push that together. If your oboe is regulated properly, these should not bang together. If, they, if the bridge keys do bang together, then there's something else uh, wrong with that. So, um, yeah, so if, if you do that, all these cork pads that are underneath here will last a very long time. Uh, cork pads are soft, and you know, if you play another brand that has different kinds of pads, like a skin pad or a leather pad, um, those will also compress. And if you squeeze on them too much, then those indentions in the pads get deeper and deeper and deeper, uh, which actually make the pad leak. So if you think about it, when these instruments are made and the pads are brand new, that pad is perfectly flat on top of that little chimney tone hole. So if you guys have seen the, the tone holes, um, and so that pad is perfectly flat on there. And the more you play them, uh, those indentions, the pad goes further down. And so every time that happens, you're creating a leak just basically with angles and geometry, okay? So, um, so yeah, just by normal playing, that will happen, but especially if you're grabbing the keys and shoving the joints together, it's gonna happen much, much faster uh, with potential of bending keys and bending rods and that type of thing, okay? Sweet. Um, so the next point uh, is swabbing, I believe. Everybody swabs or use a feather. Or, so, but this is mainly, uh, uh, mainly, mainly for swabbing. How many of you got a swab stuck in your oboe? Yeah, me too. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I got one stuck as well. Uh, it took that one time to learn my lesson. Do you have a swab too? Um, and so what I see most of the time, uh, and what I believe happens, and I'm. You know, again, there's a lot of stuff with what we do in our oboe industry that we can't prove. Um, but what I think happens, um, even if somebody checks the, the swab for knots, right, that's the first thing, make sure there's no knobs. And if you do it like this with your oboe together, then you get it to come through. And this is where people mess up. So like there's no knots, it's good. But then they're talking to their friend as they're putting the oboe away. Uh, in band or orchestra, and then they jerk on it and pull it through quickly. So what I believe happens is when that happens, the, the, the swab actually just knots up on itself by being jerked, and then there's a knot in it, even though you verify there was not a knot, um, and then you, you pull and then you get it stuck. And then if you go to the local band shop and they put a screwdriver down it, um, and they ruin your oboe. Yeah. Yeah, so we've seen many, many times um, in our shop, you know, previous attempts, you know, bore damage with drills going down from the top and screwdrivers and pliers, and I've seen, I've seen it all. Um, so my recommendation is if you are a swab user um, to follow these steps and you will never get your swab stuck, okay? So number one, check for knots, run it through very slowly and then pull the rest of the way very slowly, okay? Um, and you will never get your swab stuck. Uh, there are swabs that have strings on the other end, but that is not foolproof. I have seen many swabs in my shop where the thing knotted up on itself and the string, both strings were coming out, coming out the top, okay, right? But the premise, the premise, if you have one with a string on the other end, the premise is if you're pulling it through and you feel that it's stuck, you know, at that point you can take your oboe apart and then pull it back out, right? 
So that's great. If it works that way, that's great. Um, but like I said, I've had many that turned themselves around um, and, the, and the string was coming out the top end, you know, with the rest of the swab. So um, that can happen. Yeah, so really time is your friend. Uh, visualize, make sure there's no knots and pull slowly, okay? Um, I have seen some people that, um, that will start and go from the top. And that would be a, a surefire way to not get your uh, swab stuck. But honestly, I don't know if it does anything because if you start from the top, the swab gets so uh, compacted from the beginning. You know, I don't, who knows if it's really, you know, uncompacting and, and, and doing its thing. So um, just have time and uh, go slowly. Can I keep your elbow? Forever? <laughs> I'm buying that oboe someday. <clears throat> um, okay. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so tenon corks. Jeremy and I were talking about that also. So um, when assembling, uh, if your, your tenon corks feel tight, there could be a few reasons. A, it could just, the cork, you know, if it's a newer oboe or something, the, the cork could, could just be tight. Or the cork could be dirty, like honors. I'm calling you out. Surprise, surprise. Calling you out, okay? So, I don't know if you guys can see that, but that cork is actually fairly dark, so this is a great example, okay? And so that should be cleaned, and I recommend just a regular paper towel, a, you know, something from your house, and you can just wipe it away with a dry towel, and that'll get a lot of that grime away. Um, and you also want to clean your socket, just inside with a paper towel or something, just to get as much of that grime away. And the reason that this is dark uh, color, color like this is we've applied cork grease, right? And over time, dust and dirt build up. Uh, you know, some of the color could be from the, the metal socket material just kind of bleeding onto it. Uh, but basically, uh, cork grease you know, is, is oily type material and it attracts dust, okay? And so uh, that's just gonna build up. And so it's always a good idea to clean those corks um, before you apply new cork grease. So clean first and then just the tiniest amount of cork grease uh, apply and just um, press it around there. If you can see the cork grease on there, it's too much, okay? this the the tiniest uh, amount will work um, and so the reason that's important again just the same as assembling we don't want to squeeze the oboe too much and damage it and so because sometimes it's when the corks get really dirty like this I'm not calling you out um, actually hers is actually goes together very nicely even though it is dirty but sometimes i have had many oboes that are very difficult uh, to assemble uh, just because that has gotten dirty so uh, that's something that you can do as a maintenance thing, is just to clean that occasionally and keep, keep your joints uh, going together nicely. Um, the main part is uh, you might ask what type of cork grease to use. Uh, and so we don't wanna use any petroleum-based products anymore. Um, so like if you just got Vaseline off the shelf, you know, that's, that's no good. So what happens with that, so if you have a, any cork grease but the petroleum uh, base will seep through the pores of the cork and then over time it'll actually uh, release the glue um, so your cork will not last as long as it potentially could um, so no petroleum based products anything that's a natural product or a synthetic there's a lot of synthetic cork greases you know in general those would be good you might want to look into the ingredients I don't know what's in there but um, I know since Hannah's here with all the oboes that she sells, uh, she has her little cork grease tubes and we had that product checked and it is a safe uh, synthetic product. There's no petroleum in that stuff. So, and I assume likewise with- Yeah, I, uh, think, that, I think the Howard one, I think it contains beeswax and yeah. sort of olive oil and it's natural. Products. Right, yeah, so. You can eat it if you want. Oh, nice, <laughs> nice. <laughs> Well, that might be a. I, I use one as a lip 
Midwest. Oh, yes. okay. <laughs> so that, that's a good tip for uh, starving, <laughs> a good tip for starving college students. <laughs> uh, you can eat your court grease. Yeah, so stay away from... Uh, Exactly. And yeah. I, say, I, I, I agree with everything that Jason is saying here, by the way. But um, I would also add that I think more damage is done to instruments putting it together and taking it apart than anything else. Yep. And you've got to remember that the cork pads that ev everyone has uh, uh, are just like little sponges. So if you're pressing them, you're effectively compressing the sponge and it doesn't always recover. And, and that. Yep. Why instruments end up leaking? So, and, I mean, Absolutely. Okay, here's uh, my next point of, of care is uh, care of your oboe while it is outside of its case. Okay, so you guys don't do this because you're adults and professionals and college students, um, but you would never leave your oboe sitting out and walk away from it. Um, you know, we see this in, in middle school and high school bands. They'll have a five minute break in band and they'll leave it in the chair behind them. Uh, or even in that type of setting uh, where there's lots of people, you'll leave it on an oboe peg beside your chair. So even in a professional setting, I recommend to not do that. Um, my, my strategy for you guys as a repairer, because I've seen it all, is that if the oboe is not being played in your hands, it's in its case. Now, if you're at home practicing and you walk away for five minutes to get some water, fine. Leave it on a tabletop or something. Um, and especially like if you have cats. <laughs> if you have cats, never leave your instrument in the room with a cat unattended, okay? Because the cats will knock it off the table, right? Just when you've, they've been trained and you've been playing oboe with the cat for 10 years, someday they're gonna knock it over, okay? So anything that happens to your oboe in that regard is your responsibility, right? And so we see it a lot with the kids, again, leaving it. Um, the, the smaller kids, they say, hey, my fr flute player friend, please hold my oboe while I go to the bathroom. No, because while they're in the bathroom, the flute player, fr player friend is gonna try to play the stupid thing or they're gonna start twisting and it's gonna be a baton. You can never trust anyone except for yourself. Now in this type of setting, in a professional uh, college setting, you obviously can trust your teacher um, or other repairers or whatever. You can use that judgment because you're old enough, I hope. Um, but in general, the oboe is in your hands being played or it's in its case. Okay, and you will always, and I know it's not practical, but I'm just saying from what I've seen, um, that's the best case chance of having your oboe last and perform to its top abilities for the longest period of time. Okay, because stuff happens, it does. Um, even in you know the limited professional settings I've been in, I've seen it happen. Uh, orchestra break, people leave their instrument, they walk away, and then the uh, tuba player, because they don't have much sense, <laughs> bump into your, player. yeah, well, <laughs> it could be your colleague, the bassoon player, or it could be the next oboe player right next to you. Uh, they, they just get busy, they talking to somebody, they back into your stand, I mean, whatever the case may be. So it happens in the professional level as well. Um, yeah, so do that. And then another one uh, that I've come to, to notice a lot, and if you have a newer oboe, especially a Howarth, um, Howarth does a really good job of making their oboe cases. Uh, they make have incredible oboe cases, okay? And the reason they're incredible is because the joints actually fit on the inside of the case, okay? But all materials break down over time. So if you keep have an oboe and you play it for 10 years and you're slogging your oboe case everywhere you go and you're, it's gonna start getting loose. And so 
one thing to keep in mind, and we see this with shipping uh, to our shop. So as the inside of your case deteriorates and you lay your joint inside there, if it slides just a little bit, it could actually get damaged during shipping. So if you're shipping it to a repair shop or whatever the case may be, uh, selling it to somebody, um, especially the sec this lower joint right here, these left-hand levers, we see those damaged a lot from people uh, that the joints are loose inside the case. And so many, many of you may not have to worry about that at this point, but it is something as you go through your career um, and as you play an oboe for multiple years, that can happen and does happen. Um, and so you just want to be uh, mindful of that. And if, you're, and if the joint just does start moving inside the case, you can totally fix that by just filling up the space with paper towels or you know, something like that just to, to shore it up. Um, wouldn't believe the, the boxes we get in the shop, like people put the massive amounts of bubble wrap around their oboe case mm -hmm. in these huge boxes. I'm like, that's a bit overkill. And then you open the oboe case and the oboe is like moving inside like this. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. And so, you know, it's got to be protected on the inside first. And so that's just something I've really started to notice lately and want to bring to your attention. Although it's probably not a, again, if you're playing a new Howarth, you're probably set to go for a while on that one. Um, so um, these are some of the basic things. I know you've probably all heard that stuff, uh, nothing earth, earth shattering, but I do want to mention all those just to bring it to your forefront again. Um, um, so <clears throat> mechanically, uh, the other thing, and this is something that kind of takes this out of your hands and goes into uh, your repair professional, is that if you play a, a top of the line professional instrument, and you want it to remain top of the line and professional, it has to have maintenance. Um, you're playing an instrument that's, I don't know, seven, eight, nine, ten, sometimes more, a uh, thousand dollars, um, and you play it for five years solid, and then all of a sudden you can't play and you wonder why. Well, it's just all these mechanisms, like just like Jeremy mentioned, the cork pads, like little sponges. So every time you press it to play it, there's getting a little bit of an indention in that pad and those they start leaking over time. Um, so it's really imperative uh, that we suggest annual maintenance for people that play a lot. So, you know, if you're striving to be a professional player and you're playing six, eight hours a day, something like that um, throughout the week, you're going to need maintenance probably sooner than later. Um, I have clients that come two times a year just because they play so much and we just check it out. Sometimes there's nothing wrong, uh, sometimes there's a lot wrong. It just depends. Um, and so as a generalization, so everybody, money is always tight, right? We're oboists, uh, we're always buying a new shaper tip or you know, want the next thing of equipment or buying another oboe. Um, but budgeting uh, for your repairs is just as important as you know, saving up to buy that next uh, shaper tip or uh, a gouging machine or whatever it is that you need. You need that stuff, right? You have to have that stuff to get better at your craft. Or at least we think we do sometimes. Um, so, but the same thing, you need maintenance, you need repair so you can continue getting better at your craft. Because as you're in going up the hill and getting better at your craft, your instrument is going down the hill at the same time. Okay, so you have to meet it in the middle um, and keep the, the instrument maintained. So my recommendation uh, is for budgeting. If you're going to pay for that, 7 to 8% if you do the calculation uh, of your the new value of the instrument um, to, to have annual maintenance. So you, know, you could be looking at $500, $600 a year. Um, and so in our shop, we would for an annual maintenance, we take it completely apart, clean all the tone holes, the body, uh, all the old oil, dust, dirt, everything's cleaned, and, and then we put it back together one key at a time, making sure every pad is perfect. Uh, if there's loose mechanisms, you know, we do key swedging, um, you know, all that stuff to make it stable and solid. 
Um, and, uh, you know, if you don't do it every year, you know, every year and a half, especially two years max if you're playing a lot, but just the general uh, guideline, we say once a year on that. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I do a lot of, the, a lot of work for Hannah. Uh, Hannah's been a blessing for, for my business. Um, and I wonder sometimes, because Hannah has a huge consignment business, right? So people want to buy a new oboe, they sell their old oboe, and they'll send it to Hannah, and, and I do prep work and maintenance for that. And some of the oboes that we get, they are so run down, like, it's like they never had maintenance, and the thing doesn't play. Like, try to play it before I repair it, and there's nothing. Um, and I just wonder if those people did maintenance if they would be selling the oboe to begin with. Um, so sometimes, like, you know, if you play an oboe for a really long time and don't have it maintained, yeah, the quality of the instrument's going to go down, but it's not the wood, it's just the mechanism. It's the pads, it's the stuff that kind of makes the wood awesome, you know, kind of tops it off. So, um, yeah, just something, it's, it's really serious, um, and I, I talk about that a lot uh, because, you know, these are a big part of our lives. Uh, financially uh, and emotionally, and uh, we need as much help as we can get as oboe players. Okay, so those are the, some of the top things, uh, and if, that if you pay attention to those, your oboes uh, will last a very long time. Um, and so that's all I've got to say. So I just want to open it up and let you guys ask questions. I'll try to field those uh, the best I can. So um, adjustment. I know we don't we don't have anywhere near amount of time to actually talk about adjusting your oboe, so. Um, I teach it every year. Yeah. It's like they never heard it before. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it, yeah, it's a never ending cycle. So, yeah, so any anything that I said you're concerned about or have questions about or some totally new uh, question that popped in your head? Yeah. What are your recommendations for that? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, I have seen that. Uh, so when you start buying third-party cases uh, to fit yours, whether you're replacing an old case, a single case, or, or you want to upgrade because you have an English horn now or whatever to get the doubles. Um, so you definitely, if you buy something, you want to be able to return it. And so if you get something, you put it in there and the joints are so super tight and you can't get the lid closed, then that's not the case for you, for sure. Um, but I see that rarely. Uh, most of them do fit. Uh, what I see more often is when you buy the third party case and the joints are loose inside. And so that would not be a good one as well. Um, so I see that. I don't know if that answers your question, but you would wanna, you wanna make sure when you buy it that you fit the joints and you can return it if it's not satisfactory. Yeah. That fit. So what, what damaging would you see in that? It would be the same as if when you assemble the oboe and you're squeezing the keys too much that we just talked about. It's essentially it would be the same thing in my mind. So yeah, uh, you, you know the pressure on the keys should only be normal playing conditions. So yeah, if you if you buy one and you have to like smush the lid shut and zip it up, that's it would do damage. You know, if nothing else, it may not bend keys, but it would definitely uh, compress those corks. Could, you know, as the uh, keys are squeezed together, could um, break the adjustment corks prematurely. You know, that's, that's a lot of that. So you go from one day your oboe plays fine, but then all of a sudden the corks break through and then your oboe doesn't play the next day. I hear it all the time. Jason, my oboe played fine yesterday. But yeah. 
it did, but it's been going for months and months and months. <laughs> you know, just like a, a car, you could probably drive your car a couple days with not much oil in it. But after a few days of that, it's gonna go all of a sudden at once. But that at once has been building. It, it's not, there's hardly anything in life that's at once. Heart attacks are not at once, right? It's a lifetime of fatty foods. <laughs> so, yeah, good question. You mentioned about swabs, and it seems to me like every possible option has disadvantages. Yes. Do you have a preference? I don't. I've always been a swab user, uh, personally. Um, I studied with Dan Ross and Nancy King, and they both use swabs, so that's what I use. Usually that's the way it goes, right? You learn from your, your primary teachers and that's what you do because uh, they do it. Um, but yeah, I, I don't have a preference uh, other than taking care and paying attention. So uh, feathers, mops, swabs, doesn't yeah, matter. Doesn't matter. Um, now, uh, material wise, yes, you don't want to use anything that's cotton. Uh, anything that can be very linty. And so that's why mostly you see uh, silk pull through swabs. Um, and I'm not sure that if you get a new Loray, they've got those big purple swabs that are not pull-throughs. I don't think that's silk. It might be. I'm not sure. Microfiber. Yeah. So microfiber would be good if it's truly like a really good quality, non-linty microfiber. Because like you go in Walmart and you get a microfiber sh uh, chamois to dry your car off. It's very linty. It's not like the microfiber that we think of. So you want to make sure that's what it is. But I've, honestly, I've never seen a swab that's microfiber. So. The band is supposed to be microfiber. The what? The band. I've never seen those. So, yeah. So, and if you, and I didn't mention in the swabbing, if you do not want your swab to get stuck, just use like a silk non-pull through. And so you pull it through till it gets snug and then pull it back out. Uh, that's another good option. Um, you know, whatever you use, whether it's a swab or a feather, you're never going to get 100% of moisture out. And so it's really just comes down to just creating a habit and trying to do your best. But really, realistically, and another reason that you need to have annual services is because when you pull your swab through or you put a feather in, you're putting microscopic dust particles in your oboe every single time and there's moisture up in the tone holes that the swab does not touch. So you have the undercuttings that make your oboe so awesome. That's full of moisture and those dust particles go up in there. If I had time, I, I should have done like a little presentation for you. I have so many pictures of oboes that I'm cleaning and you look down in the tone hole and you look up in the undercutting and it's just brown. Right? So I use an enzyme-based cleaner in our shop, so it like breaks down the spit and stuff instantly. It's great. So I don't know if that helps you, but. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, you might want to be careful with acetone, but um, yeah. So I use this enzyme. It actually is a pet cleaner. Uh, that I that I found so and the reason I found that yeah yeah so in the band instrument repair world there was a guy that developed this stuff he called it pad juice and it was an enzyme based cleaner and it was designed for sticky saxophone pads okay I started using it to clean tone holes because it really broke down the dust and the dirt and the spit like instantly whereas when I was using a solvent based like a you know, a mild paint thinner type solvent didn't touch it. And you would think that it would, but it doesn't. Uh, and so that's that enzyme based cleaner worked perfectly. Then the guy that made that enzyme cleaner died and he never wrote his formula down. Um, and so for there was a period of time, I don't know, it, I don't even remember because I don't buy it anymore. But there was a period of time when that was not available because somebody bought the rights to it, but they had to do the, the chemical analysis of it basically. And so they could rewrite the formula. And so it is available again. Uh, that stuff's called pad juice. And if you want to buy that, 
Uh, you can buy it from J.L. Smith and Company in Charlotte, North Carolina. That's where I buy a lot of my repair supplies. Um, uh, pad juice. Um, now I do notice the pad juice discolors wood, so you have to be very careful. Um, like if you if you get too much and it like drips around the side of your oboe, there'll be like a little track mark. Um, so that's another reason I quit using it. And so I started experimenting with enzyme-based cleaners that I just bought off the internet. And so the one I use is it's called anti icky poo. It's a <laughs> I mean, really, it's, it's made to clean, yeah. Um, I, I buy the unscented so it doesn't smell, and it works beautifully. Uh, it works beautifully. Uh, cleans up, it doesn't uh, discolor the body at all of the instrument uh, like the other stuff did. Um, and if there's any of that spit buildup that gets in those tone holes, you put that stuff on there and it just instantly, it just comes right off. Um, so that's what I use. And then Q-tips. So instead of like a mascara brush, just you can, in most of the tone holes, you can get a Q-tip. Uh, in the smaller tone holes, I use the uh, little pipe cleaners that have the little red things on them, uh, little abrasive things, but they're not abrasive enough to mess up the wood, obviously. But um, so that's what, that's what I use. To oil or not to oil? Oh, we don't have enough time. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I personally believe in it. So if you're going to do it, uh, you do it uh, inside and out. Mm -hmm. um, but there's many people that don't believe in it, and there's nobody that can prove otherwise. So, um, yeah, we don't have enough time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, the second question, almonds versus four oils. Yeah. Um, well, so when I did, uh, when I do, well, actually, I have a, a duet now, so I don't do it as much, um, but I also don't play as much either. Um, yeah, for years I used sweet almond oil. Um, it's great. It's really thick, so you got to be very sparing with it, uh, and so you have to clean up after yourself. Um, those that believe in oiling, they believe that it uh, hydrates and moisturizes the wood, and it prevents cracking, all the reasons. So that's all the good stuff. The bad stuff is that oil attracts dirt and dust. And so if you oil your instrument, uh, you got to clean it up. You know, so if you oil it one night and you come back the next morning and you can still see oil sitting on it, you got to clean all that off. Uh, put cigarette paper under your pads and kind of, you know, make sure there's no oil on the pads. You don't want, I've seen so many oboes that are like the pads are just saturated in oil. Okay. So if the oil is like thick and clumpy and drippy, it's way too much, okay? Um, so yeah, if you're gonna do that, you stay away from it. I, I, I started going away from the sweet almond oil because it. a lot of times you buy it wherever you buy it and it's in a big jar. Uh, sweet almond oil goes rancid uh, and it will smell bad, right? So we don't use that, okay? Um, so nowadays, uh, in our shop, when we oil, uh, there's a, one of the repair suppliers sells an organic formula that was made by a repair guy uh, called Nailers uh, Bore Oil. So that's what I use now. It's, it's much thinner uh, than the sweet almond oil, and it, it doesn't go rancid, so it just, yeah. Nice. What else y'all got? I'm wondering about slug. I've noticed, um, like, inside of my instrument, like, the board has, like, lighter colors in it, so, like, kind of it's been wiped away, not wiped away, but, like, scratched slightly. I'm thinking from, like, the metal part of the, um, of the slug. Right. Is that detrimental to the way the instrument plays over time or well if that little metal piece literally is scratching the bore yeah I have never seen evidence of that um, it would be hard to believe yeah. I think it's uh, we would sorry to no no you're good um, I think it's a fallacy to when you look up the instrument and you want to see this glassy bore uh, we've done lots of tests and actually a rough bore, when it's when you're looking at it through the light, uh -huh. 
actually works a little bit better than a brass one. So your, your instinct is, that, oh, you want a nice and lovely shiny board that, uh, you know, without any score marks around it, it's better. So that is in tree. Also, the way we construct the board, it's not just a machine that's coming in and creating the shape. We use different things, three notes. And inevitably, they will, when you hold it up to the light, the light will catch it, and you will see the score line, the radial line. Um, what we've done on instruments that we've had back in the dust class or just for experimental purposes, we saw them in half to see what they look like. Mm. And actually, if you're not holding it up to the light, you can't see those marks. Mm. They're so tiny that um, you know, when you've got the thing in half in front of you, you think, well, that looks great. It doesn't look, there's nothing underneath it. So yeah. I wouldn't be worried about that. I mean, I can't think of any swab maker that would make a swab that would damage it. Right. Because normally they're sort of rounded off, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. So, but I do think, you know, in time, if you think about it, if you're pulling your swap through, you know, each, each day or in time, the clock joint will just get bigger because it's, it's more wearing it away. Yeah. And I think naturally, as instruments get a little bit older, the top joint gets a little bit bigger. Yep. Yeah. And that's why they talk about instruments blowing out. And what happens is the top joint gets a little bit too big. And that's when, particularly the low register, you start getting that bubbling or that sort of wah 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 mm -hmm. sort of characteristic with older instruments. Yeah. And they just become unstable. Yeah. So, you know, like this. Let's have a look at your joint. Yeah. yeah. You know, this this swab has the little. Yeah. Some joint, some some rest side. So somebody thought it'd be a good idea. So like. This swab has the little rubber coating on it. Okay. You I've know. Seen some that are like metal that aren't rounded off. And it, I mean, I, yeah. I wouldn't think that it would actually cause a problem, but I wouldn't use it. <laughs> but years ago when I was playing a lot, I got one with this little coating on it. And it, yeah, well, it sticks to the, side of the, yeah. Yeah. To the moisture. <laughs> it stuck to the moisture, so it was hard to get it through, so I ripped it off anyway. So. Um, yeah, so, and it could be also, um, you know, even though you swab, it doesn't get everything out every single time perfectly. And so you really, you might could be seeing like actual buildup happening at that point. I think that's what that is. That's what that is. Because you can, you can see it, can't you? So like, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I thought it was like. And so like hence cheating. another reason to have an annual cleaning because right. yeah. we would, we would clean all that yeah. out. I mean, with um, this sort of wood. Is this Coca Cola? Yes. It's um it's a very open grain anyway. Okay. So that's why you look up that and can see the grain. Okay. Yep. Um, and the, it looks great apart okay. from that little build up. That's just build up, it's not yeah. actually. Yeah. And again it's wood. you okay. sort of see it there. I I I'd be amazed if it made any difference to where it plays. Yeah. But you don't get I mean you could get a repair to clean it. Right. Yeah. yeah. yeah just just a piece of mind. Yeah. Yes. So nice to see yeah, that's great. Great point. Yep. Yeah, great point. Thank you for sure. Cool. What else y'all got? You know, stump me with something. I would say with the with the with the swaps when they get old, they just. Just yeah. yeah. What do you recommend as uh, for a non-technical person in terms of maintenance? What can they, apart from swabbing and yeah. anything else anyone can do, they can do? Other than the, you know, the things that we talked about earlier, um, yeah. assembly, again, assembly, that's my biggest thing is, mm -hmm. is when you, you're really grabbing over all those keys and assembly, so don't do that. Make sure your case is, stays nice. Um, not letting your friends play with your oboe. Um, yeah, there's not much. I mean, the oboe really is a complicated mechanism. There's a lot of keys that work together. Um, as those of you that are striving to be uh, oboe professionals and you're in college, uh, or maybe you are a professional, um, or a, an adult amateur that plays a ton, uh, you should know how to do adjustments. And so I do recommend that you start learning that. Uh, there's lots of books 
you know, you're here at this school, uh, there's a valuable resource here um, uh, with Martin. So, you know, you definitely should learn how to make basic adjustments. But as Jeremy and I have both talked about, those pads are spongy and over time they compress. And so, because when a pad is first installed, it's perfectly flat on top of that tone hole. But as it compresses, the key goes further and further and further before it seals the tone hole. But all that's doing, it's not actually sealing. It's, there's leaks in there. Um, and so when you start getting those indentions and those leaks, there's no amount of screw adjusting and turning that's gonna fix that. Um, and so, yeah, if you just take care of your oboe, don't drop it, throw it, all that kind of stuff. Clean your tenon corks, uh, swab it. Um, really, that's about it for oboe in my mind. Now, if you're a clarinet player, you know, clarinets have those big open holes. You got those, the chimneys that your finger, so, you know, you can do some tone hole cleaning as a clarinet player just because the holes are open and visible uh, with the chimneys. Uh, but really, oboists, all our tone holes are, are closed, you know, covered up with keys, uh, except for the split D. And so you could, you know, if you start seeing gunk build up in the split D, you could put a Q-tip through there and knock it out. Uh, you could do that. Uh, but a lot of times if there's build up inside the, the large hole in the D, uh, there's also gunk that gets between the split part of the key. And so then you'll notice that those two keys start to stick together. And so again, that's, another thing with annual maintenance uh, where that's clean and take, taken apart. Um. I know you mentioned the, um, uh, with the octave keys and sometimes in some cases they can press down. Yes. And I've noticed that, uh, I don't know, maybe you've noticed this as well, because the octave vents are metal, they're actually quite sharp mm. in the core and they, as they indent in the cork, it's almost like the cork is going inside of the vent now. And I think maybe oh, it yeah. acts a little bit like a piston. And as it comes up, maybe it's, maybe it's drawing water up into the, the octave vent. I don't know. Sure. Well, and when they get to that extent, they don't seal properly. Yeah. And sometimes so, you can see like a, it's, it's got like a crack going around yes. the indentation. Yes, absolutely. Well. I see that all the time. Mm -hmm. So that's another reason not to squeeze your keys because that pad is on top of that metal uh, vent and so that metal will uh, cut through it very quickly for sure. Um, one other uh, side effect of that, so uh, the second octave key specifically, if, if that pad compresses, so there's a, if you go look right below the first or the second octave key where the first octave key overlaps with the second octave key, there's that lever. Uh, when that uh, second octave pad compresses enough, that lever that's going across the wood will actually touch the wood uh, and hold that, that key will just stand open at that point. And that's just because that, that uh, cork is compressed enough that that whole mechanism just comes, keeps coming down. I see that a lot as well. Uh, but if you have annual maintenance, that's not going to happen to you, right? Um, and, you know, another point to the annual maintenance how many of you had a, have had emergency aside from <coughs> dropping an oboe or, you know, like a real emergency of dropping your oboe and something gets bent, but you're just playing every day and then all of a sudden your oboe doesn't work and it's an emergency because, because you're in a panic mode, right? So usually with annual maintenance, you don't have emergencies. Are you all right with the paintbrush? in and around keys and, and springs. We, our desert is not only gritty, but it's sort of a sticky kind of really fine grit. Hmm. And sometimes um, it just accumulates and you can't blow it off. It just stays there. Sticky, huh? Yeah. Well, so again, you want to be careful. All those uh, springs, the needles underneath, uh, you know, if you knock those off and you don't know what happened, you don't feel comfortable fixing that. Uh, or, you know, worst case, you could actually break one of them. You know, then you got to go to the repair shop for sure. Um, I would suggest first just trying compressed air. Uh, go to the office, okay. office supply store, uh, buy a can of compressed air. Uh, that'll help. Because the propellant in there sometimes comes out. It, it, there's a temperature difference. 
don't hold the can, don't hold the can, don't hold the can sideways. The can has to be vertical. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would try that first, uh, and then, yeah, I would just try that and then have annual maintenance. <laughs> yeah. But if there, if whatever you're talking about, I'm not familiar since I don't, I'm not from here. If it truly is a sticky substance, there's more concerns. I mean, that's going to get in your pads also. And so that's for a greater need of, of maintenance for sure. Yeah. Anything sticky. And I didn't mention the obvious. You know, I saw several of you this morning brushing your teeth before you played, and that's an amazing habit. Um, so many people don't do that, and so you drink a cold beverage soda uh, but right before you go and play your oboe. Where do you think all that sugar is going? <laughs> it's going down your oboe, uh, and you're going to have sticky pads all of a sudden. So um, brush your teeth, drink only water, whatever it takes. Wash your hands. Wash your hands. Yeah, people's, people's uh, hands, the acidity levels in their body react different. Uh, so if you're one that tends to be more acidic, um, you're going to eat through plating, which there's really not much you can do about that except wash your hands. But what happens with the plating goes is uh, green corrosion forms, and then that also can, be, can get in between the keys or the, the hinge rod. And so then keys can bind up because of the corrosion buildup. So if you tend to be more acidic than your neighbor, uh, washing your hands frequently right before performances and practices is going to be very helpful for you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, guys. Hope I was helpful. Um, I've got a, a few business cards for those of you that don't know me.